name is Eric. I'm a software engineer at Twitter. Um, so when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, I wanted to think about what was something new at, that related to my experience at Twitter, and what's something that's not being talked about typically at tech conferences. And I kind of thought, well, you know, Twitter's goal is to reach every person on this planet. And the thing is, we can't do that effectively if we don't consider our users' language, their culture, and then the environment they live in. So this talk, we're going to go over like how to localize your app and make the app feel native to your users. And so you can grow your app from your local audience to an international audience. Um, these are some of the products I've worked on. I worked on Digits, which is now part of Firebase Auth. And you know, we serve 217 countries, and we supported 34 different languages. Um, I also worked on Twitterkin. This allowed um, developers to embed tweets into their apps. So this is how we kind of grow the reach of Twitter beyond just our users inside the app. And then I'm currently working on the Twitter for Android platform, and I'm working on emerging market performance. So as we improve performance, our top line metrics will improve. And I'll talk a little bit about that on my slide too. All right, so the first topic is like localization. So like I said, you want your app to feel native to the users. users. <clears throat> and so when we talk about locales, generally there's like two components to a locale. There's the language, and then there's the geography. So, and this is because, for example, oh, that's mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. One more. <laughs> so, like Spanish spe spoken in Mexico isn't the same as Spanish spoken in Spain. And there's also some cultural differences between Spain and Spanish in how we display dates and times and number formats. So that's why there's these two components to a locale. So um, this, app, this is mostly focused on Android and how to do it, but these same things pretty much apply web, Android, and iOS. So OK, you want to get started. You've decided you want to grow the reach of your market. So what, what's kind of the first step? The first one is you want to like, identify your market opportunity. So you want to go ahead and look, like, what's the relative wealth of the region you want to target? What is the penetration of smartphones? And what's the population size? You know, you want to make sure if you're going to go through all this effort, you get the biggest bang for your buck. The other thing is you want to consider your competitive landscape. Um, if you have a music streaming app and you want to come to the United States, you're going to have a lot of competition. You know, there's Spotify, there's Tidal, there's Pandora, there's Amazon Music, there's Google Music. So maybe the United States is not the best place to start. And then also just the financial and regulatory factors of the region you want to operate. Um, like click-through rates in India are far lower than, let's say, in the United States. So you want, need to take these financial considerations into play and the, kind of the regulatory regimes of each country. So here's an example. Um, in the United States, we have 37 million native Spanish speakers. So these are people, according to the Census Bureau, that speak Spanish at home every day. And for context, like the United States population is about 320 million, so about 10% of the population. And 2.8 million Chinese speakers, so this is mainly Mandarin and Cantonese. And these groups in the United States control $2.1 trillion in household spending. So this is actually a big opportunity in the United States, for example, to just take your app and localize it into Spanish. And here, you're reaching these users who, and you're making the app feel native to them in their own language. So like, how do you get started? So very big, I mean, these are basic steps to get you started and get your app ready for it, translation. Um, I'm not gonna really go over like how to select a translating company or where you can go, but basically you go find these services online they usually charge something like $0.08 cents to $0.18 cents, um, per word translation. And you know, it goes from just native speakers translating, professional translators, and then you can have professional translators, and then they'll have someone double check the work. Um, and the goal here is once we have a vendor, we want to have 
uh, high quality translations, we want a quick turnaround, and we don't want a lot of back and forth. You know, we want to avoid, uh, I always hate it when I get a JIRA ticket from my translation team and saying, hey, we don't understand what's going on here, or we need more context. And so that takes back and forth, and then it delays my feature shipping because I haven't translated everything I need. So like, how do we go about doing this? So you've probably all seen these warnings in Android Studio. Um, they've been in since like Android Studio 2. Um, just make sure any string literals you have, you can just convert them into uh, string resources. Um, there's like a quick fix tool tip. You just click extract resources. You get this little dialogue. Um, you just decide where you want your default value set. And that's it. You should have something like this. Everything should be in a string resource. So you, this is your file. This is what's going to be sent to the translation center. Um, hold on for a sec. And the goal here is to get something back that's translated and it's high quality. And hopefully, you haven't done too much back and forth. So what can we do? So how can we go about doing this? So you want to provide like context for your declared strings. You want to think, um, so in this case, my app is called demonstration. And demonstration in English is what's a homonym. And so these words that are spelled the same, and they sound the same, but they have different meaning. And so when they go translate into other languages, it might not be clear which meaning you mean. So in these comments section, provide that context to your translators. So in this case, my app is demonstrating how to translate things. So this is a practical you know, explanation of how something works. So make sure you include that inside of your description. And you know, other languages have similar things. There's like heteronyms, and there's also homeographs. So these are like words that are spelled the same, but, are, um, they, but sound different, like a bow and arrow or the bow of a boat. Also include, like, where are these strings going to be kept? And so that gives in context to the translator. You know, do they need to keep the string shorter? Um, do, they need, do they have more room to work with things? You know, um, if, they need to, if it's a resource constrained space, maybe uh, they can choose a different synonym for the word in that's shorter. And so some of these things, you know, like buttons, they're usually more space constrained. So they know to be really short with their, the language. Um, like app name, it's limited to 30 characters. So make sure your translators know of these limits so that they can keep to them. And then, of course, mark the things that you shouldn't be translated. You don't want to waste time and money having things that are translated that shouldn't be. Um, so brand names typically aren't translated, so Twitter isn't going to be translated into Chinese. It's not going to be translated into Spanish. Um, certain proper names, uh, placeholders, and uh, special Unicode characters. Obviously, URLs. You don't want your URLs going to 404s and then code. And also here, you can see this is the placeholder syntax. So this is um, XML localization interchange file format. And you can have placeholders. So when you preview the string, inside um, your layout preview, it'll show true as a default. So that's a fun little trick. So OK, you've gone through. You've translated everything. Um, but now what about dates, currency, and numbers? These are things that generally don't vary by language, but they vary by the region you're located in. And so Android, Android iOS, and a lot of back-end systems um, they provide a lot of these tools, and they're all backed by the IBM ICU library. Um, it's the International Components for Unicode. It's basically C, C++ library, and it has like a Java wrapper, and it supports a lot of internationalization and localization functions for you. Um, and showing the correct time and date and format um, really helps your users recognize what's going on. You know, for example, I landed here, I got off the airplane, I, like, I really needed a coffee, and I looked at the price, it said 10,000, and I was thinking, wait a minute, that can't be right. And then I realized, wait, they just used the comma as a, as a decimal placeholder here, where in the United States they used the period. But, you know, as a, as a US user, 
um, I was initially confused, and it took a while for me to think about that and process. So one of the things on Android, they have a fun little feature. It's called Best Get Best Date Time Pattern. Unfortunately, it's only available on Jelly Bean MR2 Plus. Um, and what this does is you can use these Unicode date patterns, you know, the MM for the two-digit month, day, and year. And what happens is the order and the, the separators for the dates are irrelevant. So you give it what you want, and then it'll return the correct format for you. So here I can give it month, day, year, and for the Ukraine, uh, for Ukraine, it will return me day, month, year with the periods in between. And so like here are some easy examples. Um, in the United States, we do month, day, year. Uh, France, uh, day, month, year with the slash. You know, Japan uh, starts with the year and then here in the Ukraine. So that should look familiar to all the Ukrainian developers, I hope. Uh, also, like I mentioned, there's also helpers for decimal points, too. So in the U.S., we use the period as a decimal point, and we use a comma as a thousand separator. So like when I saw a number, that's why it was like initial confusion for me as a U.S. user. And so by displaying these numbers correctly, you know, your users will feel like this is a native experience to them. And same thing with currency. There's currency helpers. So it'll make sure that the currency symbols are located in the correct place. Um, one thing I learned with digits is that phone numbers are actually really hard. Um, it's a very hard problem to solve, and there's a lot. There's actually one really good library out there. It's like Lib Phone Number, and Android uses this phone, uh, Lib Phone Number from Google, to provide you some. Uh, uh, formatting features in Android. So what you can do is you can store all your phone numbers in one common format. So there's like an ITU standard E164, and this kind of describes how you can format international numbers. But what happens is you, you not, users, local users, probably want to see a number uh, in their national format is what it's called. And so you can give it the string that you've saved maybe in your database and then when you display the string to the users, you know, it'll be formatted in a way that they expect to see it. So like, same again, US, France, Ukraine, and uh, the UK. Also, you notice I used a bunch of these constants. Originally, I hadn't used some constants, and I thought UK uh, was a country code, but it's really GB. So use some of these constants, and it'll be helpful. Um, another issue like I ran into uh, with internationalization digits is we want to display a whole list of countries. So you wanted to select your country code and we had a list of countries, but when we internationalized things, strings weren't sorting in the correct order. Uh, you know, as a US-based developer, uh, this will work, right? Because they're all ASCII characters. But what happens is when you start to introduce um, Unicode characters or you look at other languages, um, like the Enya, N and Enya in Spanish, you want to make sure they're sorted in the correct order. And then also some languages like Spanish also have the double L. Um, Czech has like the CH. So these are called digraphs. So there's a lot of these other characters that you want to make sure things are sorted correctly. And if you're sorting things by the code point, um, it won't work. So uh, don't do this for sorting. And what you want to do is use this collator feature. So this is also provided by the ICU library. And here what we're going to do is, excuse me, we want to look, we're going to set a strength. And what happens is we set primary. And so it's going to sort based on primary differences. So capital A and lowercase a are actually uh, secondary differences. So they all sort in the same order. And also, like in Spanish, uh, with the double L, uh, Spanish is actually adapted to like technology standards. So now the double L is actually treated as just two individual Ls in sorting. And so it'll help, it, it'll provide these functions to sort everything for you. So now 
you know, when you go to my drop down list and we have the localized list of countries, I go ahead and I use this collator and the sort things, and now everything's sorted based on the correct locale. So other considerations when localizing things is machine to machine interactions. Um, generally, you want to keep, you don't want to use the default locale for machine to machine transactions. Um, you want to specify the locale that you're using. Um, like if the date is, uh, day is 17, but I in the US, you know, the parsing of that date's gonna fail because there's no 17th month of the year. So making sure that you, the locale matches the locale of your API and then translate that into the feature you need. Um, units of measure are another thing in the United States. Um, we use the imperial system. Uh, we're only one of three countries that do that. Um, so that's pretty easy to solve. And then other domains, some specific domains have like conventions that don't match the locale. So if you're doing like a scientific application, um, generally it's used in metric, right? So no matter if you're in the United States or Europe or the rest of the world, you would still continue to use metric system. Um, and in Android 24 Plus now, they have some new APIs provided by ICU just to make you aware of them. So if you're packaging the ICU library, it's pretty big. So now it's included as part of Android. So you can create like an APK split um, 24 plus. You can use the built-in ICU libraries 24 and below. Um, you could just, you have to package your own, but this way your APK would be smaller. So RTL, um, so not all users read from left to right. Some users also go right to left. And so these common languages, Arabic, Hebrew, um, Prussian, and Urdu are the biggest languages. So here's an example. Um, there's 160 million Arabic speaking users on the internet. And there's 80% uh, of phones shipped in the Middle East support Android. And, but there's only 0.8% of web content is in Arabic. So if you're like an uh, let's say the Arabic Spotify, um, you have this huge audience you can reach now if you have this content in the Arabic language. And so, like, how would you go about, you know, localizing your app for these languages? So a little history. Um, Android 4.0 was localized in Arabic, and it also included an Arabic reshaper. So you might ask, what's a reshaper? Arabic is kind of like a cursive language. And so without a reshaper up top, you see all the characters are in its isolated form. Um, and each character is rendered the same regardless of its surroundings. And so as an Arabic reader, you, you know, it's going to be slowing that you down. It's kind of like cursive. You know, when, if, if I wrote cursive and I spaced everything out, you would be confused. And you would have a, your, your comprehension of what you're reading would take a longer time. So with the reshaper, what happens is it reshapes the characters according to the surrounding characters for you. And so that'll be more natural for your Arabic-speaking users. Um, in Android 4.1, they have uh, bi-directional text support for TextView. So what happens is the TextView will automatically detect the language and decide whether to display things left or right. Um, but it wasn't very smart. It would just look at the first character, say it's an RTL, and shift things right to left or left to right. Um, in 4.2, you got layout mirroring and some better fonts. And then in 4.3, they improved bi-directional support. So now they include some heuristics. So if you have a mixed content, like Arabic and English, it'll go through, you can apply various heuristics, and it'll decide whether to display your content right to left or left to right. So here's an example of bi-directional support. So here, um, I have English, or fake English, whatever that is. And then it's going to lay everything out left to right. And then I just switch my device, or I switch the text to Arabic. It detected this it was Arabic, and it was a right to left language. No work. You didn't have to do anything. RTL mirroring. So what happens is 
you want your right to left users to experience the app the same way you do. So as you scan the app, you see my profile, then you see like my username, and then you see the text as you go across. So you want your users to have that same experience in the right to left. So what you can do is you, you have to go to your manifest and say to, that your app supports RTL. So you have to go ahead and just enable RTL support. And then what we can do is go and define, you see these you know, um, layout to the left of. Well, instead of left, you could do end of. And what happens is in a left to right, the start is the left side of the screen, and the end is the right side of the screen. But when you're in RTL mode, the start is at the right side of the screen, and your end is at the left side of the screen. So you can define these parameters. And then when you switch it, everything will be out, laid out correctly. The padding should be correct. Um, and if you're targeting 17 plus, you can just get rid of these left to right things altogether. And there's actually lint warnings in the tools that will kind of tell you this. So there you go. You switch it to your RTL language, and now everything's laid out. And your right to left la language speakers experience the app the same way as your left to right language speakers. Uh, one thing I found out is that ViewPager does not support right-to-left languages, so it doesn't automatically. So you might be scrolling um, to the right, but your you know, right-to-left language are going to want to scroll to the right. So this is a long-standing request by the community, but there's a lot of other um, developers that have created solutions for you. Um, so one of these is RTL Pick ViewPager by um, Duolingo. And then also, um, there's drawable mirroring. In some cases, you might want to just flip the image to mirror it. Um, I've never had a use for that. And then, but the one useful feature I find is that the force RTL option. So you can go into settings, force RTL, and it'll take whatever default locale you're on already, but just lay out everything right to left. And that helps you find bugs. And it's really useful because before, I'd have to switch my phone to Arabic. And then I couldn't find the setting to get back to English. So that was a little troublesome. Um, so I had an opportunity to talk with some developers in the Middle East and India. And one of the things they told me was, you know, for, uh, sorry, for the Arabic language, like, you need to make the font bigger. And I was like, hmm, well, I wonder if Google's thought about this. They must have. So I went to the material guidelines and read through them. And they basically uh, make the scripts into three different categories. So there's like the English-like ones, which are Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic. You know, the dense ones like Chinese. And then the tall ones, which are some of these Middle Eastern languages. And the guides basically said, hey, for these other, for dense and tall, you should make these uh, characters bigger to make them more readable. So, you know, kind of what I'm hearing from developers and users you know, Google's already incorporated into some of these guidelines. So these material guidelines it will be very helpful in making sure that your users and everything's readable and laid out. So the other thing is testing. How do you, you know, what are some of the things you want to look for when testing your localization? <clears throat> so, you know, you want to have a test environment set up you can look for common um, issues. And then, you know, at Twitter, we're a pretty large company, and we hire people from all over the world. We have people that speak Ukrainian. You know, we have people that speak Russian. We have people that speak English. We have people that speak, speak Spanish. So, you know, these are people that can help give you feedback on your app and how it feels. Um, so here's a list of some common issues. I mean, worst case, um, your app could crash because maybe you have a placeholder out of order or something. But uh, a lot of these things, a lot of the obvious things are caught by the linter for you. But you, know, you can go through the app manually. You can see that things are sorted correctly. Look for untranslated text. You know, look for poor line wrapping and stuff. Um, for those RTL languages, you, know, you can go to the settings screen and force the RTL layout. And then look at it. You know, is it basically a mirror of your left to right? You know, is the padding correct? Are, are the elements where you expect them to be? Um, but I found that to be kind of slow, right? I hated switching between 
um, uh, settings and my app and back and forth. So one of the things is um, on Twitter Kit, I had a bunch of timelines I used for testing. And it was just a little simple test app. I display different timelines. And so what I did is I just created a right to left timeline. And what I can do is I can on resume when I started that activity, I just set the locale to uh, Arabic, or set the language to Arabic. And then on pause, I just set the re default back. So here, just one click in my test app, I could click, I could see that everything was being displayed quickly and then continue on just going around playing with my app. So I found that really useful in speeding things up. Oh, I had a video here. So this is basically the Dubai airport um, Twitter feed. Um, the other one tool I found was from Fastlane. Um, this was developed by Fabric. And w one thing is screen grab. So you can generalize um, localized screenshots of your Android app. So here's an example. Um, you set up a simple script. You tell it what locales you want. And then it'll run through and take screenshots for you. And so you can go through all your screens. And then you can quickly visually look at your screenshots and say, hey, this is correct. Or my designer always says, hey, Eric, can you send me screenshots? And so you know, I can just run one script, take all these screenshots, ship it off. And it's very easy. And then supply. Um, also, when thinking about localization, think about you know, the Play Store and those assets in there. You want those to be localized. So when the user comes to your Play Store, you know, they see something, and it looks familiar to them. And they go, hey, I want to download that. So I found these tools pretty useful. So another common theme um, when you're looking to grow your app on, beyond these like Western markets is handling payments. So an example is like the Middle East. Um, there's only 2% of users or people in the Middle East actually have credit cards. Um, in the United States, we all have credit cards. I've probably got six credit cards in my wallet right now. 82% um, of them are unbanked. So they just live day to day with cash. Um, I probably have three or four bank accounts. And then the other thing is like things like PayPal. Um, PayPal you know, is available everywhere, but they only have about a 5% market share in the Middle East if you want to rely on them for payments. <clears throat> so like I said, PayPal, it's available in all country, but there's limited penetration. And generally, you need to have a credit card or a bank account to take money to pay. And then Strike, which is very popular, um, isn't even available in the Middle East. So what are some solutions here? Um, so some solutions are carrier billing. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, let's say you want to donate to something or whatever, and you do the SMS short code. What happens is it'll attach a charge to your bill. And what hap generally, a carrier charges a processing fee. Um, but these are usually only for digital goods. These are things that you can just kind of like take back if they don't pay their phone bill. It's generally not used for physical goods although this is becoming a thing. Um, prepay cards are actually very popular in North Africa um, and the Middle East. These are, or just young kids without credit cards. You can just go into the store, you know, buy like a gift card, and you can keep loading money on that. You just bring currency, and it gets added. And usually there's a fee associated with like adding value to the card or processing the payment. Um, I was going to go back. Some other things is like Uber in India, they accept cash. Um, Airbnb, um, if you want to go book an Airbnb in Cuba, what they do is they take your credit card, process it, and then they have a courier in Cuba that'll take the currency and deliver it to the host. So there's a lot of other solutions. Um, some other options are uh, TPayMe, which is a uh, carrier to direct billing provider. Um, they're big in the Middle East and North Africa, you know, charge things to their doorbell. Another thing is like Cashew. These are just, like I said, prepaid cards. And you can see Skype, like I said, it's popular games and, and uh, VoIP providers. So Skype takes some of these cards. Uh, the final thing is performance. Performance matters. 
especially when you're looking at emerging markets, when you're looking at places like Brazil, Mexico, the Philippines, um, and India. And what happens is if, when you pay attention to performance, um, Twitter and a lot of other companies have found out, like if you increase the performance of your app, you will increase the bottom line metrics. You will sell more products, you will have more engagement, people will view more tweets or Instagram posts. So this is why performance matters so much. So one thing, let's look at India here. India, there's about 300 million wireless subscribers, but only one million of them actually have access to 4G networks. So the majority of your users are either on 3G or, or 2G networks. And even the LTE, even the 4G and 3G networks there are slower than in most of the Western countries, and they uh, have a lot more errors rate. The error rate is higher in these countries. So um, one thing it, Twitter did is we endeavored to improve our, how we load images. Because um, images would be slow, and they wouldn't load. And if you don't see an image, or nothing shows up, your user doesn't have an opportunity to engage with that content. You know, they're not gonna like it. They're not gonna click on the tweet and look at other tweets. And so by improving image loading, we believe that we could increase our top line metrics, which is, you know, how often are people engaging with our tweets? Um, so the first thing we looked at, we looked at two technologies. And the first one was WebP. Um, this is developed by Google. It's built into Android. So you had native support. And you know, one thing we found is a 28% uh, percent reduction in size compared to PNGs. And it also supported uh, transparency. <clears throat> and we also look at uh, Progressive JPEG. So Progressive JPEG um, takes multiple scans of your image and loads it progressively. So what we found is like the first scan was only 10K. So it would quickly load that first image. It may be fuzzy, but at least the user sees something that they might be able to engage with. And then over time, it'll load the higher res image. Um, so what happens is the image is compressed in multiple passes, like I said. Uh, the only th downsides is there was no transparency support. So what we did is we did transparency detection on the image. So we looked to say, does it have an alpha channel? And then we look, even if it, uh, had an alpha channel, we checked to make every pixel and see if every pixel had an alpha channel. And if there was no alpha channel defined, we would just make it a progressive JPEG. Otherwise, we leave things as a PNG. And the other thing was there's just no native support on Android. And one of the useful things we found was this Fresco library. Um, it's an image loading library from Facebook. You know, it supported progressive JPEGs out of the gap box. And the thing is it had uh, no noticeable feature gaps. Like it supported all the things you wanted from an lo image loader. So it had caching and progress bars and scaling and resizing. So it supported everything we needed. So we used Fresco as part of our experiment. And the results were really good. Um, so what we decided, we ended up going with progressive JPEG. When you use Twitter today, that's what you're loading. Um, we found that images were 25% smaller when compared to uh, PNGs or the JPEGs. We saw a 9% decrease in P50 load times, so the image loaded faster. We saw a 74% decrease in error, errors, and most importantly, we saw uh, an increased engagement, especially in the emerging markets we wanted. So it improved our top line metrics by just improving how we load images. And the other thing we do at Twitter is you, know, you want to generate that user empathy. We want to feel like what it's like to actually operate in these 2G networks. Uh, and what, what happens is we have 2G day occasionally, so we throttle all the accounts, uh, employees' Twitter accounts. It's on iOS and Android only. And so we see how long things take to load. And so you know, we're obviously motivated to fix things. And we also do like cost notifications. So what happens is as you go through and you're scrolling each day, it'll say, hey, that same amount of data you use on your unlimited plan here, it would have cost you $5 in Mexico. You know, that's a lot of money. So that kind of gives you a feel for like how much data we're using. 
that's it. Thank you. I hope you learned something.